All right. Guess it'd help if I actually turned that on. Okay, uh, tonight we're going to continue uh, looking uh, at, at Genesis. We're in the book of Genesis. Last week we looked at chapter 1. This week we're going to be in chapter 2 and 3. Again, um, I'm, I'm not doing this verse by verse. Um, we're just kind of picking out verses as we go through this. <clears throat> I've, I've read before that that it's been said that that everything that you need to know about life can be found in the lessons that are taught throughout the book of Genesis. And I think as we go through uh, the book of Genesis, we're, we, we might actually put that premise to the test. Uh, and, and, and I think it's going to be interesting uh, to see if Genesis is going to pass uh, past that with flying colors, I guess you could say. Last week we saw how God created the heavens and the earth and, the, and, and, and all that is within that, all, the, all that that entails. And, and we saw that his response to everything that he created was to say that it was good. This week we're going to hear him say for the first time that something isn't good. And, and we're going to see something take place that isn't good at all. And we're going to learn what God plans to do about all of that. So tonight's story unfolds in, in three stages or three different acts, if you will. And then God's going to step in. So, so let's see what happens in Genesis uh, 2 and 3 in, 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 in the first phase of this story, or the first act, I guess you can say, um, uh, the, the, my first point, uh, if you want to word it that way, I guess, is that life as it should be. We need to see how life as it should be. Or maybe I should say life as it was meant to be. Genesis 1 is an overview of the creation story. Genesis 2 goes into a little more detail, and it even refers to God in more intimate terms. Genesis 1 uses the word Elohim to refer to God. Genesis 2 uses the name Yahweh Elohim. And, and, and it would be thousands of years later into the story of Moses before we, the readers, are fully able to understand the significance of the name of Yahweh. But the writer introduces it here to emphasize the personal nature of God's interaction with his creation. Everything about Genesis 2 shows us what life was meant to be. God has placed the man, Adam, in a setting that can only be described as paragon paradise. And then God puts him to work. And that's a good thing. Look in Genesis 2 verse 15. Genesis 2 verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to watch over it. The word translated work here can also be translated as serve. This was God's gift to Adam. God gave Adam work in which he would be useful. His work would involve both service and supervision. And that's a good thing. There are people who think, based on the events that you know are going to take place a little later in the passage, they, they think that work is a curse. Work is not a curse. It's a blessing. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3, 12 and 13, I know the best thing we can do is to always enjoy life because God's gift to us is the happiness we get from our food and drink and from the work we do. God puts Adam to work in the garden so that Adam can then find satisfaction and happiness in his work. 
Adam discovers the joy of a hard day's work. And then for the first time, God says that something isn't good. Look in verse 18 here in Genesis 2. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. Now, I don't know, no, I don't need to say this, but the word helper here does not mean that the person is subservient. This word is the same word that's used to describe the help that God gives us. Clearly, this isn't about being subservient. The story continues in a very dramatic fashion in which God creates all the animals and then Adam names each one. But of course, none of them are suitable to be Adam's partner in life. Look at verses 21, starting in verse 21 through 24. It says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at the place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. And I think that's how God intended things to be, that a man and a woman should be together, partners, if you will, for life. Now, does this mean that no one should ever be single? No, it doesn't. Because we can see elsewhere in Scripture where there are some who are called to a life of celibacy and solitude. But I believe in general terms, generally speaking, God's plan is that a man and a woman will be together as husband and wife. I think that's, that's the ideal. And there's another aspect of life as, as that, that we can see that, it, that, that it's how it was supposed to be. And, and, and we can see this in this garden scene. Adam and Eve lived in fellowship with God. Chapter 3 refers to God taking a walk in the garden in the cool of the evening. It's a great image when you actually think about it. And you get the impression that, that this was a pretty common occurrence. God was there in the garden with Adam and Eve, and they had fellowship together. It's what anyone would probably consider the perfect existence. They had meaningful work, fulfilling relationships, and an ongoing, unlimited connection with the God who created everything, including them. But there was one stipulation. In verse 16 and 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now the second chapter of Genesis closes with Adam and Eve living the dream. And this is how the writer sums it up in verse 26. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. That, that phrase is packed with all kinds of symbolism. Adam and Eve were living life as it was meant to be lived. And then the monkey wrench came in. And that takes us to the next act, if you will, in the story. And that is, life takes an ugly turn. In the beginning of chapter 3, we meet a new character, the serpent who is called the craftiest of all of the creatures. Now, when somebody is called crafty, that's never meant to be taken as a compliment. It's just not. The serpent has a conversation with Eve, but the Bible says that Adam is right there with her in verse 6. 
And the servant's talking about the only rule that they've been given. Stay away from this fruit tree. Now, the Bible doesn't name the fruit specifically. But we know what tree is talking about. As the serpent talks to Adam and Eve, we see in their conversation a point-by-point -point study in the science of temptation. And I think it still rings true today. Temptation hasn't really changed in all these many thousands of years. It's the same as it ever was. If you've ever given in to temptation, anyone? Yeah. Okay. You're going to recognize the process. And if you keep that in mind, it might help you the next time that you actually get tempted. The first thing the serpent did was cause them to question what God had said. Look at the end of verse 1 here in chapter 3. He said to the woman, Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? That's where temptation begins. You question what God has said. Did God really say I can't do that? Is this really such a bad thing? Is it such a terrible thing if I yell at my kids or if I lie to my boss or if I occasionally go out and get hammered? Or, or, or whatever your particular temptation at the time might be. The first step in temptation is to get you to say, is this really a rule? Because if it is, I don't think it should be. That, in effect, is what the serpent said to Adam and Eve. Look at verses 2 through 5. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it, or you will die. No, you will not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that's the next trick that the devil has up his sleeve. He'll question what God has said. And then he flat out contradicts it. No, you're not going to die. And that's what happens during temptation. That voice will whisper in your ear, you know, nothing bad's going to come from this. The so-called consequences are made up. In fact, this is going to make your life so much better because you're finally going to be in charge. You're going to call your own shots. I could probably spend a long time talking about the many different ways that we see Satan contradict in our cultural values those things which God has said to do or not to do. But let's just take a, couple, a look at a couple of them. Hopefully those won't hit too close to home. Jesus said, love your enemies. Sometimes we have a tendency to treat this commandment as if it's optional or even non-existent. Sometimes we think it's okay to despise certain people because, you know, we're right and they're wrong. We're good and they're bad. Jesus said we should never speak to others with words of contempt. And yet, when we paid for a service that doesn't work out, or the waiter doesn't get our order right, or the kids don't do what they were supposed to do, for some people who are otherwise quite religious, it's like that rule never existed. That's what temptation does. It lures its victims into saying, God never said that. And if he did say it, he didn't mean it. And even if he did mean it, well, then he's just wrong. And just so you don't start trying to nitpick 
what Jesus might have meant. Speaking words of contempt would also apply to typing and posting words of contempt. Temptation wants you to question what God has actually said and to God contradict what God has said. And then when you're at your most vulnerable, temptation wants you to think about it as often as possible before you rule it out. Look at verse 6 here in Galatians th or in Genesis 3. It says, Then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. Here's the fruit. It's good for food. It's quite pleasing to the eye. It's desirable for gaining wisdom. Those are all excellent things. What could possibly go wrong? Temptation and the one who is behind temptation is like that certain kind of salesman who's offering a product that you don't really need and you can't really afford. He doesn't want you to think about the payments and what a strain that it could put on you financially. He just wants you to think about all the theoretical benefits that this product is going to offer you. Prestige, comfort, style, security. The devil knows that if you'll just think about it, if you'll just consider it long enough, you're going to finally get around to doing it. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 28, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He's saying that thinking about something bad is just as destructive as doing something bad. Because thinking it all too often leads to doing it. It's like Jesus is saying, if you think about doing something wrong all the time, it's as good as done. So we see this process at work in Adam and Eve, questioning God, contradicting God and thinking about all the reasons why they should disobey God. And then after Eve gave the matter some thought, in the last part of verse 6, it says, So she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. And then look what happened next in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. The result of their disobedient wasn't wisdom. It was shame. The serpent has nothing more to say to Adam and Eve. He considers his work done. Adam and Eve feel the need to cover themselves. And then when God comes to walk in the garden with them, in the cool of the evening, they feel the need to hide. Life has indeed taken an ugly turn. And just when you think it can't get any worse, we enter into the third act. Because now comes the dreaded aftermath. When God comes walking in the garden in the cool of the evening, he calls out to Adam. Hey, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I was naked and ashamed, so I hid from you. And God's response was, who told you you were naked? Now, you haven't been eating from any apples, have you? Okay, I know they weren't apples, okay. Adam's response has been used countless times throughout history. He said in verse 12, The woman you gave me 
she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So what was he saying? He was saying that it was Eve's fault and God's fault. Because God was the one who brought Eve into the picture to begin with. And then God turned to Eve and he said, well, Eve's response has also been used countless times throughout history. She said, it was the serpent. He deceived me and I ate. So yes, Eve was the very first person to ever say, the devil made me do it. And, and, and this is the first part of the aftermath of the fall. We have a tendency to place blame on whoever or, or, or whenever we can. We, we become masters at saying, it's not my fault. In fact, the more I think about it, it's your fault. We live in a blame-addicted world. It's not my fault. It's my parents' fault. Or the government's fault. Or it's your fault. God, however, didn't accept either of their excuses. He dealt with the serpent. And we're going to look at that here in just a minute. But he also dealt with Adam and Eve. He said, in effect, there's going to be some fallout because of what you've done. Eve, Childbearing is going to be difficult. Labor is now going to be painful. And you're going to find yourself in a constant power struggle with the man. And then he turned to Adam and said, The ground is cursed because of you and full of thorns and thistles. Your work will now be painful. You'll survive by the sweat of your brow. And when your life is done, you're going to go back to the dust that you came from. And then he invited Adam and Eve to vacate the premises. In verse 23, we see, So the Lord God sent him away from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. This is the fallout of the fall of man. This is the dreaded aftermath. Adam and Eve would go on to raise a family. Their first sons were named Cain and Abel. And their family life would often be characterized by chaos. And the chaos would continue from generation to generation. And life would become more and more of a mess until the, the day that God called on a man named Noah. But we'll get to that down the road. Now, about the serpent. God told him that he would spend the rest of his days crawling on his belly and eating dust, like a snake. And then God said something that makes all the difference in the world. It was a prediction, a, a foreshadowing, if you will. Look in verse 15. Genesis 3, 15. It says, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now, that's the Holman that I normally read out of. I want to read this out of the contemporary English version for you. You and this woman will hate each other. Your descendants and hers will always be enemies. One of hers will strike you on the head, and you will strike him on the heel. It's pretty obvious that that last phrase, that last sentence, is a foreshadowing of Christ and the crucifixion. It was a minor victory for Satan. He bit him on his heel. But then came the crushing blow. On the third day, Jesus rose from the grave because death simply couldn't hold him back anymore with the power that he had. And Satan 
was crushed. Since the days of Eden, Satan has been a defeated foe. The victory is ultimately ours through Christ. Paul said in Romans 5.12, Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. Now he was talking about Adam there. But then he says, just down in a couple of verses, verses 18 and 19 here in Romans 5, So then, as through one trespass, there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act, there is life-giving justification for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. That's the promise of God for people everywhere. Today, we're living in the aftermath of the choice that Adam and Eve made. But let's not lay all the blame on them. There's a sense in which their story is our story. We've all made the same choice. We've all chosen with intention to disobey God. Every one of us are sinners. We know that because in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Death and sin entered the world through Adam. And today we live in the aftermath in a world that's not as it was supposed to be. And we're chained to sin in a way that God never intended for his creation to be. So what can we do about that? Well, you begin by surrendering your life to Christ, obviously. He died on the cross to pay the price for each of our sins. And then he rose from the grave, crushing the serpent's hold, putting an end to whatever claim your old life may have had on you. The serpent still comes around from time to time, trying to question trying to contradict, trying to, conjo to conjole us into considering a life of disobedience. But the serpent doesn't like it. He doesn't like it when Christ intervenes. He slithers around. His head's flat because it's been stomped on by the heel of Christ. He's a defeated foe, and we don't have to be his victim. Romans 5.17 says, Since by one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. That's God's answer to the aftermath. Life in Jesus Christ. Take out your prayer sheets, if you would.